Hello, uh, thank you for the attendance. Uh, my name is uh, Toyd Weidemann. I'm working in the games industry since 30 years, but I just skip all this because you can simply Google me and you have all my talks and uh, everything I, uh, I did in this industry uh, wrong and right. Uh, I always try to give my learnings of everything I did wrong and uh, give it to the audience uh, so that you don't repeat my mistakes. Um, I'm a freelance consultant in free-to-play and online mechanics, uh, speci uh, specifically in online games. Um, here are some of my clients. It's just an exhibit of, uh, of the past two years. There are, of course, a couple of more, but it's just a, you know, an excerpt about that. Um, uh, the, game, the games list is too many, but this is just kind of a, a career excerpt of the, the, the past games which has been released, with one exception. Uh, Assassin's Creed Identity is going to be released end of February on iOS first. Um, so, uh, if you want to check out my latest game, you can download that in a couple of weeks. Please do so. Um, the topic why I'm here is uh, simply because many, many clients approach me and uh, complain about their performance in the App Store, um, and there are certain complaints which repeat themselves all the time. And I noticed that many of them repeat the mistakes of other clients which they already did. So somehow these learnings are not either made public or these learnings are not really pushed through the audience. And that's uh, something I try to do today. So to give you a little bit insight that most of the mistakes clients do when they develop new games are done in the beginning and not in the end. And that's why most clients who approach me with a ready-made game uh, in soft launch or in beta uh, I, most of the time, I tell them, you know, I can optimize your stuff, but for most of the things, you know, it's already too late. Um, to, to get your, your brain straight about where the main problem lies is a misunderstanding of the market. Um, and that's what I want to t uh, tell you at first, so that you get the foundation why the, the most of the mistakes are being done. So, as you know, that uh, half of humanity owns smartphones now, um, and that roughly 60% play games on it. Besides social network and you know, all the other things we do on smartphones, games is the number one thing people do on these devices. So it's the most successful gaming device in the history of mankind. Um, but just that fact should ring a lot of alarm bells in your mind, because most of these people do not have our knowledge of, of games uh, you know, they didn't play Pac-Man, they didn't play the first Doom, they didn't play the first RPGs, you know, they, they don't even know what these are. Um, so many people uh, call them casual, but uh, I don't uh, call them casual because that immediately puts them into the draw of, let's say, King Games, which you heard uh, in the past half hour. Um, I, I call them newbies, you know, they're new to games, so they're uh, alien to, to a lot of things, how games try to talk to them. Um, another interesting point is that the average age of these gamers is 31. You're not talking to kids, you're not talking to teenagers. Most of the time you're talking to adults. And there's a 50-50 split between men and women. Because there's a 50-50 split of men and women in the world, it's, you know, with 3 billion devices, of course, the, the split is natural. Um, and again, most of these haven't played as many games as we do, meaning that they don't even know uh, how certain icons look like. Um, so, that means that there's a consequence in the App Store which you see, specifically if you look at the charts. First, most games aren't full 3D. What I mean with full 3D is not the display that they're actually using 3D graphics to display their stuff, but they're not fully 3D navigatable. Because a step from 2D navigation in a game to 3D navigation in a game is a very big step in terms of control, and you're immediately moving to a core audience if you try to do that. Uh, you know, there are so few successful uh, games which try to do full 3D na navigation, you know, you just can kind of like on one hand. So these are the exceptions. Um, also, most of the games we see successful have bright graphics, bright color space. The reason is that dark games are usually addressing a core audience because dark games immediately come with core mechanics. You know, a, a zombie dungeon crawler, um, a, a 3D horror game, you know, all these are core games. This is not addressing the gamers out there who are new to games. They don't even know what these are. They look at a dark screenshot and they have no idea what they see. They don't see it. You can make a test. Take a screenshot of your game and show it to a gamer and tell him, what do you see? And he can immediately tell you 
the game mechanics, where the score is, how the controls might be, you know, he can kind of envision a lot of things. Now show that screenshot to your mom. She sees nothing. And this proves that, you know, this is really important that, that they cannot even read the language of your graphics. Um, another thing which is important, because we are uh, working for a worldwide market, and we are not talking about only US, which is like 50% share, we are also talking about the huge Asian markets, there are many Asian markets, it's not just one, uh, and of course, you know, Central European market, um, that they are all different and that they need settings which are common in these markets. So if you pick a setting which is known to you, I don't know, Star Wars. Star Wars is a worldwide brand, it's huge. But there are many countries out there who didn't grow up with Star Wars. They haven't even seen the first movie yet. So your IP is worth nothing in these. So if you try to establish a setting which works worldwide, you're in a really difficult position. It's really hard to do so. And if you check the charts and the most successful games, they actually have settings which, wor which usually work worldwide. So the first thing <clears throat> we can talk about is colors. It's such an obvious thing that most of you are following it without even asking why, because the top games are all bright. So this is an, an analysis of all the top uh, games in, in the charts, what colors they use most often, even with color coding. Uh, there's a lot of research in the, in the internet. You can either uh, uh, take this link here uh, once you have access to the slides um, or you, know, you can simply Google it. Uh, there's lots of research about what colors uh, uh, are being used in successful games. So more, most of them use a bright color space simply because dark games communicate really hard to the user. Um, that means for you that dark games usually don't sell well compared to the competition yet. Of course, when we talk about the next years, a lot of these newbies to games will move to mid-core, will move to core. And, you know, we are to talking at some point about a huge core audience which actually might like dark games, like it happened on PC, like it happened on consoles. Um, the other thing you will notice is that a, a really odd setting or style doesn't sell well yet. An odd setting is these artsy, really strange things. Even gamers say, this looks cool, but, you know, I haven't seen this yet. That, that, that style also has a problem communicating specifically if they use the wrong color space. Th that doesn't mean that you have to follow this blindly. Most of you actually use bright colors without thinking about it. Because you say most of the games are bright, so we are actually doing that. But you should, of course, you know, adapt the colors to your, to your setting and to your game. Um, it, uh, there are games out there who are just black and white who are successful, and there are games out there you know, who are just kind of yellow brown who are successful. You, know, you have to find your own unique style but uh, try to prevent dark games unless you target a core audience. In terms of cute graphics, it's the same thing. Uh, cute graphics have been around in the iOS App Store uh, since the App Store exists. Um, and as most gamers don't know that many games, cute graphics are, are, have it a lot easier to communicate to the audience than abstract graphics or gamer graphics or ultra-realistic graphics. Um, they're easy identifiable, and that's the reason, you know, there's a theory behind it, uh, uh, why that happens. Even kids understand them immediately. If this is an evil guy or a good guy, is this a magician or not, you know, it's really easy to, to, uh, to see that on, on that small phone. Um, but that doesn't mean you should automatically adapt that. I don't tell you, if, if all the games would have a bright color space and these cute graphics, you don't stand out. And if you don't stand out, you don't sell well. So that's, that's the difficulty you have, right? You want to go bright, you want to go with a graphic style which is easy to communicate, but on the other hand, you're just one of so many that you have a really hard time standing out. This is the challenge you will have uh, when you, you know, define your setting in your game. And as I said, most of these mistakes are being done in the beginning. Usually style and addressing the audience and making focus group tests with your graphics and your style it's usually not done at all, or it just comes automatically into the game because you're so much, you're so busy doing your core mechanics and monetization and all the other stuff that this is actually kind of a second thought. But it should not. It should be your first thought. What setting, what genre, what style? Do we have a large enough audience which understands uh, how we talk to them? Um, here's another problem, uh, which is a kind of uh, self-fulfilling prophecy. Because there are so many excellent games out there which feature the bright color space and the cute graphics, the audience we talk about is being trained that this is a normal graphic style. 
they don't know any other graphic style. And that's of course a problem, because if they only know this graphic style, they might not actually like that your new better graphic style actually, you know, is far better for your genre. They might not know it because they simply don't understand what you're showing them. So it's a slow process to actually train this audience, which is trained on, on, on King graphics and uh, on Clash of Clans graphics and so on, uh, to get them to a more realistic, you know, mid-core style. It's happening, you will see that uh, happening in the next two years, but it's a slow process. And the, the amount of people who actually are attracted by this, you know, is, uh, is getting slower and slower, uh, smaller and smaller, meaning that you're going more to a core audience, but that's not really uh, a problem. Actually, it's a huge advantage. I'm coming to that in a second. So here's one thing you should remember, everything I say here. There are always exceptions to this rule. There are these games coming up which, you know, does, do everything uh, different, and you see, see, Toit said this doesn't sell, but this game actually does it. Well, there are always these exceptions, and the exceptions are really hard to identify, and they do something really right, hit the right spot at the right time, and if you just do what they did, you might fail. So just take this as a guidance. Exceptions is important, and it's very hard uh, to actually, you know, pinpoint these as exceptions. Um, on the PC market, for example, League of Legends is an exception. That's the reason why most of the other MOBAs are not successful, because it's an exceptional uh, game. So, first problem, user acquisition. Uh, number one topic since uh, the App Store is that high. Um, uh, you could have asked the King designer, you know, how much money do they spend on user acquisition every month? Um, any guesses? Do you, need, do you know how, many, how much money King.com spends on user acquisition? I can tell you in a second. Um, the, the number one learning here I can give you is that you can never beat the top spenders in the user acquisition market. You cannot beat King, you cannot beat Supercell, you cannot beat the billion dollar companies at all. You can't. So why do you try to actually compete with them in the user acquisition space? You can find channels where you can still compete, but you know, hands up who can afford a five dollar user acquisition cost per user. See? What I mean? One hand. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, but it's really, really tough, right? Uh, and the prices are skyrocketing during Christmas and over weekends. And, you know, it's uh, really hard to compete here. So, but here's the thing. Since the App Store exists, this rule uh, is still there. And the numbers are still right. Uh, if, you, if you dig deep in your numbers, is that 30% of your users are coming from user acquisition, 50% from word of mouth, and 20% from App Store features. This is rough estimate. Um, now, here's the thing. Why do people complain so much about user acquisition as the only weapon to actually acquire users? The number one reason is because it's the only acquisition they can control actively. The amount of money you spend is being converted into users. These users can be measured how much money they do, uh, yeah, that, how much revenue they actually get in, and this is your revenue. You know, return of investment from the spending in user acquisition. It's, it's the number one control thing. That's the reason why this is their main weapon out there, and they cannot control Apple features. They can influence it, but you cannot control Apple. Um, and word of mouth is a very abstract concept. Most people don't understand it. Um, most people don't design the games that they're actually excellent doing this. Uh, and it just happens or not. Just to measure how many users you get for every acquired user by word of mouth is something which is really hard to measure. You can do it, and you should do it, because it's vital. Now, if half of these people are coming through word of mouth, there's another important thing. If someone recommends you a game, you're putting much more value in his opinion, because he's a friend or your girlfriend or you know, whoever, um, than an ad popping up somewhere on Facebook or somewhere else. You know, there's already trust. The, the, the people who download the game by word of mouth are ready to engage into the game for at least a couple of hours before they say, ah, no, this is not for me, because someone recommended it. This is the number one most important user acquisition method you can have. And many games do the mistakes that, uh, um, that you know, from the start, they actually don't support it. So when the sum of top mobile companies spend more than one billion on user acquisition per quarter, you cannot compete. One billion every three months is the money, the budget you have to compete against. Most of us cannot do that. But in word of mouth, you can compete. You can do that. And this is, you know, my, my, my biggest advice here is that you try to learn the, the biggest word of mouth games out there, you know, by recommendation, how they actually do that and why did it happen. There are games out there which spend 
a fraction of their revenue in user acquisition and they're just using other channels and most of their uh, user acquisition is coming from word of mouth. Um, if you read the history of a game called Best Fiends, uh, it's by Sirius in, uh, in Finland, uh, you should actually learn from them how they managed to get over 20 million downloads by spending, you know, not much on user acquisition, but mostly on other things. Um, so, <coughs> if World of Mods generates two times the sales of paid advertising, what does it mean? The first obvious thing, and this is a, a topic which has been repeated a lot of times here, is the icon and your app name. And many, many clients coming to me still do mistakes here. So the icon is very obvious, right? A better icon can double your downloads. It has been proven. So the icon is not something you just give to an artist and he does three and you just say, oh, this is nice, we take this. No, no, no. You, you must test your icon against the users, which generates the most downloads. And there are trends in icon style. We had icons totally flat. We had icons only with gold borders. We had icons, you know, with faces. You know, at the moment, if you look at the charts, everybody has this, you know, this kind of face and a warrior and, or beautiful woman or whatever there. But if most of the games do that and you do it as well, you don't stand out. So icon is an advertising weapon for you. And it's important for word of mouth. Because imagine this evening, we meet at a bar. And I can show you this really cool game I love. I said, look, look at here. And you say, oh, this is cool. And you know, we get a little bit drunk. And the next morning, you know, we have a headache. And you try to remember what game I recommended to you. There are two things which springs in your mind, the icon and the name, even a fraction of the name. And if your name is really bad, it's really hard to remember. So good, good names like Clash of Clans and Angry Birds are, are really easy to remember and really easy to search. No, apps or search is something else, it's an entirely different topic, but it's important as well. But of course, there are, there are evil names as well. Like if you go to, you know, I just invented this name, you know, Ikobonini Steps to Hell, uh, it actually gets truncated. Truncated names are really bad, specifically if there's some really strange word uh, in the front. One of my favorite strategy games uh, is called Rimmed Capsule. No one can actually spell that name right. It's the, the biggest mistake the developer did. You know, it should have been named differently. Um, and this is, you know, you should test this. And here's the thing, the name of your app has to work worldwide. And if you're sitting in Finland doing your app, or in Serbia, or in Israel, you know, wherever my clients are, do you test your name against the American market, against the Russian market, against the Asian market? You should. There are even names out there, you know, which means literally bullshit in another language. You cannot do this, but you don't know. So you have to check with the most important markets. Um, so the length of the title is important. The competition of this title in the App Store is important. There's also a trend here in the, na in, in the names. You know, how many games are there which has an, the word Clash in it now? Simply because they, they follow the Clash of Clans hype and you know, they try to get part of their user acquisition because people are looking for Clash and suddenly they, they, they uh, download your game instead of the right one. <coughs> but this is not something to envision. You should be the one setting the trend that Clash is a cool name suddenly in the App Store. Um, search is important. Search is, is co more complex than just the app name. Apple indexes a lot of things uh, in your app um, and you should learn how that works and you know put a lot of work into this so that people actually can search for your game a lot easier. Um, and of course the brand. You know you try to establish a brand because if you have a really successful app and you want to repeat that success, re-release it every year or make, a, make adjustments or versions of that, you know, you should be the one who's actually you know, setting the trend, like the class trend or the age off trend or the angry trend or whatever there were, or the birds trend. You know, there were many trends in the app store where people tried to clone the name, uh, the success of the name itself. Just this, the icon of the name, is worth half of your word of mouth. Because if someone cannot remember the name or the icon of your game, he won't find it, and he just tries for a couple of minutes, and if not, he might not even call, the, call his friend and ask, listen, what was the game you recommended? No one is doing this. He just wants another game and plays the app. There are so many games out there, uh, he, he won't research into this. So icon and name is something you have to focus group test and market test, and there are ways to do that. You can simply Google it how to do it. Um, it's a very important tool. The advanced tools, of course, is networking. Networking means that you know, if a client comes to me with a newly finished game and they don't have Facebook Connect, I just, you know, why not? I want to invite my friend and tell him how cool this game is. Um, you know, Facebook Connect is a must 
game center support. Um, there are games who, who can SMS invite with a bonus code, uh, which is really cool. Um, uh, you know what the Penguin is? It's not Linux. Does anyone know what that is? It's the largest social network in China. You have to implement these as well. For every target market, you have to customize the implementation of social networks. Uh, Vcontact is the most important one in the Russian market, so you have to support that. Um, the same, uh, you know, wh who has WhatsApp support in his, in his game? Hands up. One game. You're my hero. Uh, WhatsApp is the number one messenger out there in the world. Why don't you support it? If you have a role-playing game with clans and guilds and everything, why don't you have a chat room in WhatsApp automatically done by the guild members? Why don't you do that? Well, here's one reason. Um, people don't like to give out their phone number, which is tied to WhatsApp, to their guild colleagues. Okay? So what is the number one app being used by games? Because it doesn't require the phone number, but actually just your nickname. Does anyone know what chat program I'm talking about? Most games are using this by now. It's called Line. You know, you can implement line support and suddenly, you know, people love to connect and see, hey, guild battle is on, you know, and talk, talk about it. You have to implement this. Um, and there are certain standard mechanics. If I invite someone, I should see the status of the invitation. I should gain something if he advances through the game, you know. I should be motivated to invite my friends, that they play with me, that we can interconnect. He should be automatically placed on my friends list, and I'm automatically pla uh, placed on his friends list, so we can actually chit-chat, trade, and God knows what mechanics you put in. You have to put in asynchronous co-op mechanics between friends so that the invites actually are worth something, and not just spam my friends and I get something. That's like old-fashioned Facebook five years old. No one's doing this anymore. Um, and of course, you have to put in guilds and clans. Um, if you don't have, if you have an asynchronous co-op game or an online game, uh, an asynchronous one, and you don't have guilds and you don't have guild goals in there, you're doing a big mistakes with live chat. You need chat in your game if you have an online game. Chat is the number one retention mechanic of any online game. So. Many, many clients I had to actually push implementing chat. Um, so just with these, you already have everything in place that word of mouth can take off if your game is good enough. That's how easy it is. And most of the people are ignoring just these basic facts. Another topic is the genre and the setting. It's one of my favorite topics and it's always a big fight with my clients, you know, a positive fight, you know, because this is like where my heart is, uh, which I heavily believe. Um, your setting needs to be mass compatible <coughs> worldwide. And that means that the Western setting, you know, cowboys and Indians, uh, it doesn't work. It doesn't work in any of the game markets. It doesn't work on PC. Now, there might be some gamers here, but, but, but Red Dead Redemption was really cool. Well, yeah, here, there you go, the exception to the rule. Red Dead Redemption would have worked in a ninja setting because it's an excellent game. It doesn't matter, you know. The Western setting, so far, in 30 years of my history, never has had been top 10 consistently. You know, and here you go, there are games using the Western setting. Why is that? It's easy to explain. Western setting in the US, it's part of the dirty history. They don't want to actually, you know, they kind of like to forget it. It's not a sexy setting for them, although they have all these cool movies and things. In Europe, we have this ro romanticized version of Western, somehow. It's, it's kind of popular, but the thing is, it's popular with kids. If, if you dress up in a costume, who dresses up as a cowboy? Kids do. But your game is not for kids, your game is for adults. For adults, cowboys is not a cool thing anymore. The same thing is for underwater. The same thing is for space and sci-fi, unfortunately. Have you ever seen a sci-fi and space game in the top 10? Very, very hard. It's even hard on PC. That might change now with Star Wars. I hope that Star Wars does to sci-fi what Lord of the Rings did to fantasy. Fantasy was hardcore at once. If you tried to buy a fantasy book, it was right beside porn. That was where fantasy was. Then came Lord of the Rings, the movies, and suddenly, bam, you know, it's like number one literature nearly everywhere. I hope that the same happens to sci-fi now due to Star Wars. But right now, space and sci-fi are niche. That's the second reason why space and sci-fi is niche. It's a dark setting. See? And bright sci-fi or space games are really hard to sell. Um, 
And that means also no dark dungeon. So if you do a dungeon crawler and it's really dark, you know, you don't ex expect to be as successful as someone who can pull off the same mechanics in bright graphics. Um, the general rule here is that a setting works well if a human feels well in that setting. Um, it's kind of, it's, it's hard to explain because World War II is kind of, you know, we don't want to be in a war, but on the other hand, it's a cool setting to actually fight with guns. This is, you know, uh, the thing here. But if we say that the setting has to work worldwide, suddenly we, are in a pro we have a problem. Because if you're talking Lord of the Rings, it might not be a huge license in Vietnam, which is a big market, or in Southeast Asia, but uh, works really well in, in the US and Europe. So if you want to go to Asia, and you know, they have a totally different fantasy setting than we have, you might have a problem here. So the setting is really important to pick. And if you go with the genre on top of the setting, you have a problem because you're dig jagging target audiences, you know? And let's, let's uh, see it here. So if you do an action game, your audience is younger automatically because older players are not attracted by action games. If you do a strategy game, you attract an older player because strategy is something older players like. There has been a lot of research here so uh, about even competitive stuff like PvP. The older you get, the less PvP you like. So if you do a PvP game, you're attracting 26-year-olds and younger. This is your core audience, 90% male. So if you do a PvP game, this is your audience. No, live with it. You cannot take a setting which suddenly uh, targets older players. Um, PvP means male. Casual means female. A dark game means a core audience. A bright game means you can nearly target everyone. The US loves strategy games more than anything else. In Asia, they like competitive games more than anything else. So they, there you go. It's contradicting all over the place. If you try to make a game addressing everyone in every market, it's impossible. So you have to measure how large the audience is you're going into, and it's automatically defined by your setting, by your graphics, and by your genre. So if you tell me these three things, I can roughly tell you how large your audience is uh, being measured by the 8.1 billion gamers we currently have. This is how important this decision is in the beginning. And don't play it light, right? If possible, make your game in a way that you can change the setting and the graphics. And many, many people do. They release their game in different various settings. And uh, have you seen this happening? There are strategy games uh, in the App Store which re are being re-released. It's the same game, just with a different setting. It's, you know, there's a Vikings variant, uh, there's a Roman variant, there's an Egyptian variant, there's you know, tons of stuff. Like, it's seven times the identical game. Kabam did the same thing. Um, and what they learned is that when they do this, they don't cannibalize each other. They actually are broadening the market. And this is the reason. If you say, I have a Roman setting, you already have fractured the market. There's a big market who don't like Romans or who have no idea what the history is, like the Asians. Now, you're just adding to that by putting different settings there, and you just hit someone who said, hey, I like Vikings, so you just you know, play the Viking version of your game. So you can actually do that. But your game has to be prepared to actually allow this. Um, so there you go. Uh, there's a, the last one is an important one as well. Uh, the average age of pairs is older than non-pairs. I don't know if you know this, but you know, most pairs, of course, and this is logical. Uh, older means that you have a job, you have a regular income, of course you can spend more. Uh, the younger the audience is, the less they pay, and the less your conversion is. Um, there's another key, uh, uh, learning which I you know, basically have to tell you, is the, the curse of charts and KPIs. Um, if you look in the charts, uh, it's the first mistake you do. Because the charts are very alien. It's a, let's say you have 1,000 games in the App Store, um, and you have a top 10, it's representative of the whole games, right? But if you have 1 million games, the top 10 doesn't mean anything. It's just like the tip of the iceberg. If you take this as a rule, you're totally misjudging the, 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 the long tail here. So it's the first kind of key lesson, is the average conversion rate in the App Store, if you ask around, is 3%, less than 3%. Some, someone says 1.8%, you know. It's so low that it's so misleading that I have to tell many clients, you know, don't take that number, ignore it completely. Because average means nothing. And here's the mathematical proof. You have four different graphs here, four completely different ones, it's obvious, right? But the mathematical averages of this graph on the right side are all identical between these four graphs. It's called the Abercrombie uh, Quartet, you can actually Google that. Um, and that, that's the problem on average. If you average something, it means that the negatives and the positives are evened out. You don't see that. And here's the thing. 
there are many games in the charts which have a conversion beyond 10%. There's one game which has a conversion in their home territory of 50%. Okay, I repeat that. In their home country, the, 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 the key territory of that game, they have a conversion rate of 50%. No one believes me that. I said, well, I can show you here. I have written proof that it's 50%. Which game I'm talking about? Does anyone know? Come on. Which game has 50% in their home country? Puzzle and Dragons in Japan. You can Google that. It's in their shareholder report. Um, it's totally amazing, right? And if you average Puzzle and Dragons worldwide, of course, 80% of their players are all in Japan, only 20% outside, you know, they average of beyond 20%. Clash of Clans has beyond 10%. Uh, there are many other games who have beyond 10% uh, conversion rate. So here you go. You can, you can be a king.com and have 500 million players and a really low conversion rate, less than 4%. This is what they say. Or you can have a smaller audience of 30 million, but 10% pay. And you can still be a $1 billion company. And this is a key lesson. If you find your audience and you can fully engage this audience, it can be as really small, but if your conversion is high and the, your income is high, you can still be really successful. Um, so, you know, remember that. The averages you learn in the internet and in all the reports, you know, take that with a grain of salt. It's really dangerous to actually take that as a business model or as a foundation of your business model for your game. So, the, the thing is that I cannot enter the top 10. You know, top 10 is our goal. Uh, yeah, we always to be top 10, but forget this goal. Simply because most of these games are years old, and they, if someone pays for such a game, he won't leave the game. So they stack up players for years. For four years, they stack up players and they, they stay there. And you're just a new game. How, how can you beat them? It's impossible. Simply don't, don't set that as a goal. You know, if you go there, that's fine. Uh, and it is possible because, you know, every year there's a new competitor in the top 10 to actually enter that. But uh, for me, the business goal, be top 10, is bullshit. And this is what I've written here. It's, you know, it's not a, it's not a good business goal. A good, a good business goal is be profitable. That's cool. So if you have 15 people on a game and it does a million a month, you're profitable. You're highly profitable. And then you can grow up. And at some point, you're making, you know, maybe 10 million a month. And at some point, you might be even, you know, beat the 300 million a month, uh, a year. Like so many games are in the, in the top 20 now. Um, so, again, average and charts are very dangerous to look at unless you analyze the charts carefully. So if you're an App Any fan like I am, uh, and you look at all the charts and stuff, uh, they send out a quarterly report with all the numbers in, and this is my major tool to actually analyze things. You know, there you can segment games into into groups, and these segments you can see is the segment growing or not. This is much more important than if, if a game goes up in the charts. Um, you can see games, you know, going actually a type of game going up in the charts in the top 100, and you see, hey, there's a new genre coming up. You know, maybe we can actually compete with that. Uh, this is much more interesting than just, you know, gluing your eye to the top 10. So, uh, so, some of the advice combined, okay, is the first one is don't be a sheep. You cannot believe how many clients come to me with a game which already is like number one trending in the App Store. So, two years ago, it was first person shooters on the App Store. Then came the MOBAs, like 10 clients with MOBAs. And now, since a couple of months, it's card battlers. You cannot believe how many clients come to me. Oh, we have this card battle game. We, you know, we, we're going there. There will be hundreds out there. You know, and how many can succeed? Not many. You should not follow the, the trend. You should be the one who actually sets the trend. So my advice is be unique in game and genre. Go where the holes are in the App Store. Don't go where everyone else is, because it's really tough to compete. Um, be cautious with public data. You know, learn how you have to, have to interpret this data and learn from that, because there are always exceptions, there's always better ways to go than averages. Don't do dark games. This is my number one advice for anyone who do a dark game. Uh, most dark games don't sell, uh, specifically because the audience don't like uh, dark games, the screenshots look weird, uh, and it looks odd in the App Store as well. Um, and analyze with care, you know, learn, learn, learn how the App Store works, how the, all the numbers works and things. Um, this is the, the, the key advice. And your game from the start has a much better chance to succeed if you prevent these mistakes, uh, because in the end, when it's too late, you know, you, you already failed. And that's a pity because of all the work you put into your game. Well, thank you very much. I only had like half an hour and uh, I'm open to question and answers now.
Well, I think we've officially run out of time now because it's lunchtime, but I know you're oh, going to stay I'm around. Sorry. But the question I want to ask is awesome slides. Where would we find a copy of those slides? Uh, actually, I think Casual Connect will publish uh, okay. the video uh, and, the, and the slides on. Um, I forgot the URL. Okay. Yeah, it, actually, you should be a fan of the Facebook group and it's being posted there. Okay, that's great. Awesome. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you.